Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Always the logistics. Um, we're so glad to see you here. And those of you online, we welcome you this morning. Um, I have a few announcements to share and then a call to worship. And I've been told I'm going to be interrupted at some point. But a um, couple of things that are happening. This coming week, um, we have the Youth in Action our teens are going to be working from here at Jewel Lake with the chapel teens, and they are going to be serving at um, New Hope Compassionate Ministries for the Thanksgiving. And so we're excited about that. And we also want to know that, huh? I was confused, like, wow, I didn't know that. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's on the 23rd. It's not, it's not at the fellowship, it's at the, okay. yep, it's at the bigger ministry. Um, so that's on the 23rd at 5 p.m. Um, make sure that if you're one of the youth that the leaders know that you're coming so they can expect you. Um, also, be aware that we have the youth are meeting. It's very exciting, I guess, for the teens. Meeting in the pastor's office um, shortly after uh, Sunday night prayer. So very exciting to have the kids doing something. We thank Natalie and... Uh, Lindsay for really pushing and driving that forward. It's great to have the youth getting involved here. Um, and I'll let Troy speak to the ministry fair. You bet. So outside of the sanctuary, down the hall on the way to the restrooms, where you will all undoubtedly go at some point today, there are a number of booths, and each of those booths has to do with something that we do here in the church to affect our community for Christ. And it's something that you can be involved in. i got to be really honest with you. I have been at a lot of churches where there are certain people that just don't get involved in anything. They just don't do anything. And I say, hey, why didn't you do something? And they say, well, nobody ever asked me. Well, guess what? I'm asking you now, personally, each one of you, that, that there are things that, that we can do. Now, the beauty behind most of these things is you don't have to be the leader and you don't have to develop any kind of plans, or any of that stuff. Most of these things are just show up and be involved. And the other thing is, none of these things are, if you put your name down, you're stuck doing this every day for the rest of your life. None of these things are that way. They're all fairly limited involvement. You can, you can do one of these activities for a day or a week or a month or for a season or an hour every now and then or whatever works for you. Many of them have to do with Things that are regular recurring, one of them is uh, building and grounds. Maybe you want to be involved uh, in pushing the lawnmower every now and then in the summertime. Great, sign up. It doesn't mean you're the only guy doing it. It's just something that you would do every now and then. And then you say to me, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm so old. I'm so incapable, you say to me. Back when I was younger, I used to go downstairs and hang out with the children. But now that I'm over 20, I just can't do that anymore. Because you see, I have a hangnail, and walking down those stairs would just be too much. Okay, fine, no problem. How about you sign up for the most important ministry of all, the prayer ministry? This requires no physical exertion on your part, but is the most important thing that we do here in the church. Anybody can do this, any age, multiple opportunities. It's so easy. You don't have to develop curriculum. You come on Sunday evenings and pray. You come be part of the team on uh, Saturday mornings, every now and then, that work with the folks that come through the food bank. It's just incredibly important and something that you can do. Seriously, there is an opportunity for everyone out there. We also will have two community ministry partners here today, uh, the food bank, if you want to be part of that. And actually, that is one where we will be looking for a director, but it's, it's not as brutal as it sounds. And Darlene can tell you what is involved in that. And another one is the Community Pregnancy Center. We have some great opportunities to be involved with them as a partner. And they'll be here after church to tell us about some of those. And these are things that they're fun. They build relationships. It's part of being community. You can come and do that. So I guarantee there is something out there for you. I want you to know that we will be having after church some reverse bouncers at the door. And they're going to stop you and ask you, did you sign up for anything? And if you didn't, they're going to make themselves real wide in the doorway and say, oh, well, maybe you should just go take another look real quick. So, and here's, and now listen, maybe you're already doing something. Great, you can sign up for that again. 
And maybe there's something else that catches your fancy. So after church, we'll be doing that. We'll be talking again about that as we wind church down. You want to make sure you take a look and be part of those things. It is absolutely not only vital to keep the kingdom moving forward, but it's vital to keep us growing in relationship. Thank you. I think I'm still on. Thank you, Pastor Trey. Um, it is important that we are there for one another and... Um, I agree, prayer is foundational and we can all be praying. Um, I'm letting you down, yesterday I was not here um, for the mobile food pantry for prayer and so we do not have the cards up here. Um, they might be in the office so I might run and get them but please take it, the opportunity to um, look at those and lift up the people who are coming through they're coming through for a practical need, but we can be addressing their spiritual need as well. So let me give you a call to worship, and then we'll return into that portion. This is from First Chronicles 29, verses 10 through 13. Praise be to you, Lord, the God from everlasting to everlasting. You, Lord, is the greatness in you, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give thanks and praise to your glorious name. Amen. Stand as we begin worship.
there is one thing in all of Jesus' teaching that he specifically says will choke out your growth, keep you from being what you could be in him. And he says it's the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. And I thought, man, this week was a week where we worried about life a lot. I mean, the people that I have spoken to in this body have been so distracted this week. A lot of it has been stuff totally out of our control. A number of the folks here were ill, and that'll get you worrying about life. You know, a number of the folks here had things come up with, with uh, their job situations or living situations that were distracting. And we come on Sunday morning, it's time to focus. It's time to just set those things aside and say, you know, I, yeah, I, I was distracted this week by the things of the world, but I know that the world will pass away. That all that's really going to matter at one point is that I can sit face to face with Christ. So I invite you this morning to make this part of the service the most important part for you. It will be for me the part where we can get face to face with him. Don't simply be a spectator or use this time to zone out or maybe check your Facebook. Now as we go to prayer, it's time to focus on Christ and say, this is what I've come for, is to be in your presence. So let's take the time, find a position of prayer, come to the altar if you like, kneel right where you are, sit or stand. Let's, let's just take a moment and engage with him. Father, how we need you more than anything. We are so easily distracted. Anything we see that's shiny or poses danger or catches our eye, we so quickly take our eyes off of you. So we come this morning asking, Father, that you would draw us into your arms that you would draw us into your presence, that you would pour out your spirit on us, that we would be able to worship, that we would be free to, to let you know that you are worth more to us than all of these things that distract. You are our God and King, and whether you choose to leave us on this earth for another hundred years or take us home today, we just want to be in your presence, sitting face to face with you in this life or in the next. So we come this morning to unload these things, to set them aside. It's not that the things that concern us aren't important. Lord, we understand that these things must be dealt with, and so we just present them to you. You have told us that you will bear up under these things, that we should trust you even like the flowers trust you that they'll have petals, and the birds trust you that they'll have food. We should just trust you. And live in that kind of freedom that, that we know that these things aren't the end of it all. But, but in fact, it's you. You are the reason and the point in this existence. And so we pray, Father, that you would not simply meet our needs. Of course, we need you to meet our needs. You tell us to come with our hands out asking for our daily allotment. But so much more than that, we ask that you pull our eyes up off of these needs and put them onto you, that our hearts would be completely yours, that our homes would be completely yours, that our lives would be completely yours. Draw us into your presence, we pray, even today, and we thank you, Lord. Amen. There are a great many requests up here. 
the people of the community are becoming more open and honest with us in their requests. We're seeing it's moving beyond just, would you pray for my son who has a test in school this week, to some deeper needs. There's one particular person who stated that her, his or her spouse is an alcoholic and that this is kind of a, not something they talk about. But would we be praying? Yeah. Yeah, we can be praying. Many needs like that um, are represented each week, and, and you can certainly be involved in praying for these folks. They are trusting us to do so. So, uh, apparently, I don't have an engineering degree. There we go. If you would take your Bible this morning... And open to Matthew chapter 6, you'll find a passage that we've been talking about for a while, starting in verse 9. You might want to see it in your own text. I have told you before that I tend to read and study, at least at this point in my life, out of the Christian Standard Bible, which is a modern English translation that resonates well with me at this point in my life. There was a time that I studied out of the NIV, and I have studied out of others. It's not that this is the best This is just the one that at this point in my life fits where I'm at. So I'll be reading out of the Christian standard, and I have to admit that as we come to our particular section today, well, the Holman translators, I feel like, missed the mark on this particular point that we'll be coming to today. Our verses start in verse 9. Jesus says, Therefore you should pray like this, Our Father in heaven, Your name be honored as holy, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses." We'll stop and and pray there. Lord, I pray that you would guide us in our discussion this morning. There's a lot to understand, and we have simple minds. So we ask for your wisdom, that you would teach us, that you would help us to understand what it is you want us to grasp today. We thank you, Lord. Amen. I have thought a lot about how different styles influence people. I am a child of the 80s. I was born in the 70s and did my most formative growing up in the 1980s. That's why I became a teenager in the 1980s. I followed all of the trends. And maybe like me, you saw the show Fame on TV. Or maybe like my mother, you went and saw the movie Flashdance multiple times. And so maybe you, unlike me, had leg warmers. What is the deal with leg warmers? They are stupid looking. Can we just all admit that this is the dumbest fashion thing? Besides, have you ever been walking along and just thought, oh, my calves are cold. The rest of me is fine, but oh, my calves are cold. But see, the people on Flashdance wore leg warmers, and the people on, on Fame wore leg warmers, and so all the ladies had to look like them. Maybe you remember Farrah Fawcett hair. You remember Farrah Fawcett hair? I notice that's making a little bit of a comeback. It's not a horrible hairstyle. The problem with Farrah Fawcett hair is that every lady had to have Farrah Fawcett hair. I even happen to know, I am not allowed to talk about my family anymore in sermons, I was told. But I know of one beautiful young lady who, when she was a freshman in high school, had Farrah Fawcett hair. And I just want you to know, she looked hot. But anyway... I did not have Farrah Fawcett hair, but I did have a members-only jacket. Yes, I did. It was pearl white, and I thought I was so cool with my members-only jacket. Yes, yes, I did. Maybe you had the checkered shirt or the primary colors. I mean, that's some valuable and important stuff there. I'll tell you a little secret. When all of my stuff shows up, I'll show you a members-only jacket that I still have. Yes, those things are important. Maybe though, you remember the most influential styling trend of all. It's in this picture. This, by the way, is the most controversial picture 
the NBA has ever released. Did you know that? This picture right here, Michael Jordan, number 23, April of 1985, playing for the Chicago Bulls. If you were coming into your teenagehood like me at that point, and you thought basketball was the best thing ever, even though you couldn't play it like me, then Michael Jordan was the guy. Come on, nobody could beat this guy. And in April of 1925, pardon me, of 1985, I'm not quite that old, he made an enormous fashion statement, and it was ridiculously controversial. Can you see it? It is on his feet. He had red shoes on. Now, you got to understand that at this time, the NBA had a rule that your shoes had to be at least 51% white. And the only thing about the shoes that could not be white is if you either had a number, like your jersey number, or some sort of team insignia on your shoes, so that you would know whose shoes are whose. Otherwise, all the shoes had to be the same because the NBA didn't want the shoes to be distracting to the game. They didn't want people watching the players' feet. Nike, in 1984, signed a $5 million contract with Michael Jordan, which was a big amount of money back in those days, to advertise Nike shoes. So Michael Jordan was wearing completely white Nike shoes. And Nike said, there's got to be a way, there's got to be a way to get our brand image out there. And so they began to study this rule by the NBA and discovered that the fine for violating this rule was a whopping $5,000. So for $5,000 in April of 1985, Nike got 43 minutes of camera time 43 minutes of commentators talking about these illegal shoes. And I got to tell you something, even I had red Nike high tops after that. Because Michael Jordan was cool, and whatever Michael Jordan did, I was going to do. And if you were a boy like me in 1985, you were doing it too. Did you know that that is discipleship? Did you know that? The word disciple literally means follower. Do you remember the scene in John chapter 1? Jesus has come and met with John the Baptist there by the shores of Galilee. John the Baptist points him out. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And two of John the Baptist's disciples, a young man named John and a young man named Andrew, were thinking they were about 14 years old at the time. They approached Jesus And Jesus said, what is it I can do for you? And they said these words, Master, we want to see where you are staying. In those days, every good rabbi had disciples. Well, you didn't even have to be a rabbi. Your favorite philosophers had disciples. Socrates had disciples. Aristotle had disciples. Gamaliel, the teacher, had disciples. One of them was a man named Saul, who became the apostle that wrote much of the New Testament. You see, if you were a teacher in those days, if you were valuable and important in those days, then people, typically young men, teenage boys, would come to you and say, I want to be your follower. I want you to be my Lord, my master, and I want to come and be your follower. And what that meant was, I will follow you everywhere, and I will do everything you do because I want to be just like you. When you eat, I will eat. When you sleep, I will sleep. When you use the restroom, I will use the restroom. The things you say are the things that I say because I want to learn how to think and act just like you. This is why in Luke chapter 11, the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray like John the Baptist's disciples taught him to pray. John the Baptist, well, he was pretty cool, and prayer was important to him, and so everybody who followed him had to learn to pray, but Jesus, you are even cooler. We want to style ourselves after you. We want to model ourselves after you, and we can see that prayer is the single most important thing you do, that your entire life is based on prayer, that when you need to make a decision, it starts with prayer. When you are pleased with how things have gone, you stop and pray. When you are in a hard time in your life, you spend all night praying. Somehow for you, Jesus, prayer recharges you. It doesn't drain you. 
It recharges you. And we want to learn to pray like that. So will you show us how you pray so that we can emulate it? And he said, yes, I will. He said, when you pray, use this particular outline. It's a good place to start. Learn to pray like this. There's much to be learned from it. He said, first of all, you call him Father. Our Father. Now, you got to understand, not just anybody could call God Father. No, you had to be an adopted child, redeemed by Him. Our Father. It's a, it's a statement of, of tremendous grace and mercy. It's a statement of real humility. I can't come to you on my own, Lord. I can only come because you've adopted me in. Our Father in heaven, because you are the mighty God. High above anything and anyone else. You are mighty God, able to do all things, and yet you are my Father. And so I say that I want your name honored as holy. When people see me and they hear my name, Christian, and realize that I have taken your name because I am your adopted child, I want them to say, hey, that God that you serve must be particularly special. I want them to see that you are holy. When you pray, Jesus said, you pray to God, your kingdom come. You tell your Father God that you will no longer be king over your own life. You're stepping away from that. You want to serve in His kingdom. And you say, your will be done. You tell Him, if there is anything you want from me, anything that will advance your agenda, your kingdom... Well, then I am telling you right now, Father, that I will do it. Your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. In heaven, you said, let there be light, and light just flat was. When you say to me in my life, I need you to go and do this, then, well, it just will happen. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Give us today, Father, our daily bread. There are basic needs that we have. We are humans, and so we are needy. And we're not going to go looking for somebody else to satisfy our needs. We're going straight to you. Every day, hands out, together, corporately, all of the needs we have together, being honest with one another about what we need. We're coming to you together with our hands out, trusting that you will give. And, well, we know that we miss the mark. We know that we don't always get it right. And we know that when we use our lives that you have made, that you have given, that you have supplied for something other than your kingdom and your will, that we are, in a sense, stealing from you. We are then indebted to you. And so we say, forgive us our debts. This doesn't mean make them just go away. This means we're asking you to pay them off for us. You pay off our debts. As a matter of fact, there are people who have mistreated us. There are people who have stolen from us. They have stolen our energy, our time, our goods, our resources, our purity, our thought life. They have stolen from us. So we're going to ask you to pay it off for them too. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, like we talked about last week. And then one more thing. Oof. We ask that you don't bring us into temptation, but you deliver us from evil. I want you to know that of all of these clauses, this is the one that required the most struggle on my part. The most studying and thinking and praying and pacing, because you might have noticed I pace a little. This, This is the one that really got me. What in the world is he talking about? Now, I've been talking to the teenagers in youth group. We've been talking about Bible study methods, and one of the things we've talked about is that if you're stumbling over something like this, take a look at the original words. Words matter. Take a look at the original words. And this was originally recorded in Greek, and so I started looking at it in Greek, and there where it says, and do not bring us into, that's exactly what it means. Don't lead us there. We don't want to go there. We don't want you to lead us into a place or situation. So that's really simple. But that next word, temptation, well, that one, hmm, That one's a little bit more loaded. It is the Greek word parasmos. It's the Greek word. It's not going to be a test. The Greek word parasmos. And it has a few definitions, and they all kind of revolve around the same concept. Here it's used in an ethical sense, and it means a trial or a testing or a temptation or a tribulation. 
Incidentally, it can mean the same thing physically, a physical trial, a physical testing, a physical temptation, a physical tribulation. It all kind of has that, that same meaning. It's just applied ethically here. And I took quite a bit of time to try to figure out what this is about. And, and one of the places where this word is used is Hebrews chapter 3, and it's referring to an Old Testament story when the Israelites are coming out of Egypt. The Israelites have come out of Egypt. They've been wandering around for a little while. They're wandering through the Sinai Peninsula on their way to Mount Sinai, where they will receive the Ten Commandments from God. On the way, they come to a point where they have gone about three days without finding fresh water. And so the people are thirsty. There's a couple million of them out there. They're thirsty. The animals, they've got all their flocks and herds with them. They're thirsty. And so the people test God. They tempt God. It's that same word, parasmos. They come to God and they say, are you really with us or not? Is God really with us or not? And Moses doesn't know, so he goes to God. Are you really with these people or not? I'm putting you to the test, God. Are you going to do something for these people or not? And God says, go out to the rock at Horeb with your staff, and I will split the rock and water will come out, and you'll see that I have passed the test. Or perhaps you'll see that I've overcome the temptation to just wipe you out. Or perhaps you'll, you'll see that with you I've overcome the trial of no water. Do you understand the term? Parasmos, it's a test, a trial, a tribulation, trouble, a struggle. This is different than where Jesus says in John, in this world you will have trouble. That's the word blipsis, and that has to do with a a pressing or a persecution. This is trials and tribulations of life, the testing that we go through. This is the word that Jesus uses in Mark 14 when he tells the guys that are waiting for him in the garden, Peter, James, and John. He says, pray that you will stay awake so that you won't fall into parasmos. This is in Luke chapter 8. I mentioned the parable of the sower this morning. This is in Luke chapter 8, where he talks about the sower going out and casting seed. And some of that seed falls into the rocks. And there it finds good moisture, and so it sprouts right away, but it has no root. So when the parasmos comes, the struggle, the trouble, the sunlight in this case, comes out, well, they just wither. There's no root. This is the same word that Jesus uses when he mentions that he himself has struggled in his life. And he tells all of his guys, you have been with me throughout my struggles, my troubles, my trials, my temptations, my parasmos. Jesus himself dealt with this. And that makes sense because in Rome, or pardon me, in Corinthians chapter 10, Paul tells us that no parasmos has come on you except what's common to men. This is something that happens all the time. You should just be expecting it. It's common. And know that whenever you face parasmos, God will give you a way out. This is what he tells them in Galatians chapter 4. When I came to you, he tells them, I was in a time of great parasmos, but it didn't wear you down. Paul warns Timothy about parasmos continuously about how he needs to try to avoid these times in his life because they're coming. And he tells him specifically in 1 Timothy 6, don't strive after the things of the world. Don't try to get healthy, wealthy, and wise. Because people who do face tremendous parasmos. This is the same thing James talks about, though, in James chapter 1, where he tells us the testing of your faith produces endurance. He says you should face these times with great joy because you know that because of these parasmos, You'll become strong and faithful. Your roots will grow deep. This is what Peter tells us in 1 Peter, where he tells us that we should not be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes upon us. Because this is the kinds of things that anybody can expect. These kinds of troubles and struggles. And yet Jesus says, pray to your Father, that he doesn't lead you to any of these. Wait a minute, Jesus, we want to be like you, and you faced many of them, so we know that we will. Wait a minute, Jesus, Paul tells us we shouldn't be surprised because it happens to everybody. James even tells us we should face it with joy. Peter even tells us that we should joy in our salvation in these times. What in the world are you talking about? And I thought as I studied this, maybe the key was the part about leading us. Because if you read again, 
through the story of the Israelites wandering in the desert. And you get out of Exodus 17, where we read about when they put God to the test, you find out that he led them right back to the same place in the book of Numbers. Oh, by then it had been nearly 40 years. The original folks had died off and there were new people now who were going to go take the promised land. And the new people were going to go take it because the old people didn't pass the test. But the new people, well, they had some testing that they had to pass. And so he brought them right back to the same place, right back to the rock at Horeb, three days with no water, and said, what are these folks going to do? And they came to him. And they said, Moses has led us here to kill us. Moses wants us to die of thirst. Moses, what are you going to do about this? And Moses stood up with his stick at the rock and said, Must I bring water from the rock for you, you rebels? And he hit the rock. Well, the rock, in God's grace, still gushed open with water. But God said, You all have failed the test. You were supposed to be just trusting me, not in yourselves. That can't be it. Why would we ask God not to bring us into a time of testing of trial, of tribulation. We're going to face them anyway. Wouldn't you rather God be the one to bring you there than this world if we're going to face them anyway? And if they're going to make us stronger and allow us to rejoice in our salvation, shouldn't we want to be in those kinds of situations? But then in my own mind, I realized that the key to this question is the word but. That's the key. In Greek, it's the word Allah, A-L-L-A, but. And it means not this, but that. It means instead of this, I would rather that. Rather than bringing us into a time of testing and temptation, what we're asking you, Lord, is that you deliver us. That you deliver us from evil. Now, hold on. If you're reading the CSB, you know that I misread that this morning. If you're looking in the NIV or the King James or any of those, you know that it says, deliver us from the evil one. But if you're looking in your King James, you can see that the and one are in italics. That means they're not there. Now, why they were added in, we can have a discussion about that later. But let's get back to what Jesus must have really been saying when he said, deliver us from evil. We don't want you to lead us into a time of testing and trial and temptation. Instead of leading us there, how about you just do this? How about you deliver us from evil? Okay, what's evil? Well, in Greek, it's the word poneros. And in an ethical sense, once again, it means Wicked or evil or bad. Okay, that makes sense. This is a word that Jesus used a lot. He always used it the same way. And here are some examples in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, he says, Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else comes from evil. He says there are a lot of people that go around with big words to promote themselves, to make themselves look better, to sell you something. Oh, I got 14 paragraphs about the extended warranty you ought to buy. He said, don't be that way. He said, be simple, be direct, and use integrity in what you say. Be a person of integrity. Anything else comes from evil. In Matthew chapter 7, give me a second. In Matthew chapter 7, he talks about how you know that your Father God will give you what you ask for. He'll give you good gifts. If you ask for uh, for bread, he'll give you bread, not a stone. If you ask for an egg, he'll give you an egg, not a scorpion. Now, you would do this for your children, he says. You would do this for your children. You know how to give good gifts to your children. And you are evil, same word, poneros. There is evil in you. And yet you know how to give good gifts to your children. Don't you think that God will give good gifts to you, his children? And then again, in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus has just healed a paralytic. As he heals the paralytic, he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And the people standing around him, the Pharisees say, Who is he to forgive sins? And he says, That's the evil in your heart. You're jealous of me. You think that you're better than me. It's a word that's used a lot in the New Testament. Luke chapter 3 has a really good example. Herod Antipas has been called out by John the Baptist for marrying his brother's wife. Now, this wasn't 
any kind of sexual connotation. The fact of the matter is his brother's wife was of higher rank politically than he, and if he married him, it would move him up the political channel. And John the Baptist called him out for this and other similar kinds of evil that he was using others for his own gain. Romans chapter 12 talks about it in the exact same light. 1 John chapter 3 talks about Cain and Abel, which we talked about at length on Wednesday. And he said, why was Abel accepted but Cain rejected? Well, because Cain's actions were motivated by evil. Cain came to God and said that he was good enough on his own. Cain came to God and said that, that I can promote myself. You see, this idea of the evil is what Paul calls that old man inside, that selfishness inside, that motivation inside that says, I want to make me more important than anyone else. The motivation inside that says, I can take care of myself. I can find my own wisdom. I can find my own resources. I can do it my own way. I certainly don't need God. That is what sidelined the man and the woman in the garden. That selfishness inside. You ever really thought about the story of Cain and Abel? We talked about this on Wednesday. If you're not cluing in on the Wednesday study, I strongly suggest uh, come if you can. Uh, there's actually a sign-up out there with all of the other sign-ups for Wednesday night dinners. There is a good dinner every Wednesday before the Bible study, and it's, it's very valuable. Come if you can. If you can't, catch it on YouTube. You can listen to it in your car or watch it on your TV while you're doing something else. Uh, it's good information, and uh, it's teaching that we make available to you that you want to be a part of. We talked about Genesis chapter 4 quite a bit on Wednesday. We talked about Cain and Abel. See, the situation was it was time to go to church. It was time to come and worship God. It was time to sacrifice. And Abel said, I will sacrifice to you with the very best that I have. I will give you my absolute best because, Lord, you are are worth it to me. I understand, Lord, the picture that you've painted, that there is no covering without blood, that there is no forgiveness of sin without some sort of sacrifice. And so I take the best of what I have And I offer it to you, and I offer it to you in such a way that I will never have a part of it again. It's just gone. It's burned up. I offer it to you. Cain came and said, well, I guess it's time I got to go to church. (laughs) Would have liked to have slept in, watched the football game, but I guess I got to go to church. And I guess I got to bring something. So here's some kale nobody's going to eat. Here's some grapes that are a couple weeks old. Some stuff left over from last night's salad. I'll just bring that. That'll be good enough. It's really, listen, it's really not worth it to me to bring my best. My best is for me. My best is to take care of me. Listen, I'm going to have a girl over later, and I want to really impress her, so I'm going to make sure that that the, the best is saved to show her so that she thinks better of me. Mom asked me to make dinner later this week, and so I'm going to make sure that the best that I have is for that so I can impress mom with my preparation skills. I want her to think highly of me, you see. As far as God goes, whatever, I have to, so I'll just bring some stuff. And so he brought before God less. And when God rejected his offering, it tells us that he was despondent, that he was downcast, his face fell, he got depressed. And he was furious. He became very angry. And God said to him, why are you despondent and furious? Why have you gotten so upset? Don't you know, God said to him, that if you do what's right, you'll be accepted? But if you don't do what's right, he said, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. He personifies sin, like like one would personify a lion. I remember a story, you might remember this. Uh, I remember watching 60 Minutes when I was a kid, and there was a story about this group of lions in Africa that somehow had gotten a taste for human blood. And, And guys would go out to hunt you know, on safari or whatever, and these these lions, mostly young male lions, would stalk them. And they would select one of them. One of the men, the lions would select one of the men, one of the hunters. And the, and the men would go and they would make camp for the night and they would go to sleep and the lions would wait. They would wait crouching behind the bush and whatnot. And when all the men were asleep, one of the lions would sneak into the camp, grab one of the men by the throat so he couldn't even scream, drag him out of camp and they would kill, it. They would kill the man and consume the man. 
Well, the other guys were sleeping. Oh, freaked me out. I never wanted to go to Africa after that. That's the picture. There is a lion waiting to come and drag you off. If you don't do what's right, if you continue, continue to entertain sin, if you continue to promote that evil inside of you, there is a lion waiting to drag you off and consume you. He says, you must rule over it, have dominion over it, be the master over it. You know, this is actually something that we can all understand. This is something Paul talks about. Romans chapter 7, really long section, but you know the section. Paul says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold as a slave under sin. For I don't understand what I'm doing, but I do not practice what I want to do. Instead, I do what I hate. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's good. I mean, I know I'm being bad, so that means I know that there's good. So now I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that's in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. For I don't do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I don't want to do. There's that word again. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, I'm no longer the one that does it, but it's sin living in me. It's not my fault. I can blame the evil. Paul says, so I discover this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. Can you understand this? Paul is saying, I really do want to do good. I really do want to put God first in all things. I really do want to practice agape love, pouring myself out for my Lord God and for the people around me. I do really want to treat people in that way. I want to be a person of integrity. I want to be a person who pours out my life for my family and my friends and my community and my church. I want to be that kind of person. I really do. But I find that so often the things that I do are the opposite of that. So often the things that I do are motivated entirely out of selfishness, poneros, evil. What am I supposed to do about that? Well, that's what was going on with Cain, and God says, you must master it. How am I going to master that? Because let's just be honest, that thing inside of us is often much stronger than us. Oh, well, the next verse tells us how. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. You let him do it. Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. There's this one point in here. Who will rescue me from the body of death? Paul, many commentators feel that Paul is referring to a, uh, a method of Roman execution that's particularly brutal. If someone had killed someone, and was found guilty of killing that person, and the Romans felt like the person ought to be executed for that, what they would do is take the person who had been killed and tie it to the live person, the dead body, face to face, toes to toes, nose to nose, fingers to fingers. That's pretty gross already. Then they would take that person with the corpse tied to them out into the desert and drop them off. And what would happen is the, the, um, the vultures and the other birds that eat carrion would come and start picking at the dead body, but also picking at the live person. And as that dead body began to rot, it would also rot the live flesh. And the person would be out there until they died that way. And if someone tried to rescue them, if someone come and tried to set them free from that, then they would face the exact same fate. That's pretty brutal. Paul says, what I feel like in this position is just like that. There is an old dead me tied to me. I have determined that I'm going to follow Christ. I have determined that I'm going to do what's right. But there is this old dead me that's tied to me. And every time I try to do what's right, well, I'm stuck with this old dead rotting me. But Christ came, thanks be to God. He took the dead me, and he faced my penalty as a result, and he set me free. And so I am not condemned. I can live free now because he took the old me away. I think that's what Jesus is talking about here. Listen, there are a couple of ways to grow in discipleship. There are a couple of ways to grow in faith. There's the hard way and the easy way. You can have the hard way if you want. 
You can say, Lord, I, I want to be one of those seeds that's cast into the rocks that has to learn how to grow the roots. Lord, I want to be one of those people that has to make a second lap around Sinai and come back to Horeb so that you can see if I'm good enough yet to follow you. I, I want to be one of those people who has to learn it the hard way. Put me through trials, temptations, and testing because I know that it'll produce endurance. Lead me to where life really stinks, Lord, so I can show you how great I am. Or you can choose the easy way, but... Lord, how about instead you just deliver me from the old man inside? How about instead I, I just come and offer you up this dead body and you make it alive? How about instead I just come and offer you up this selfishness inside of me and you replace it with love? How about that? Let's maybe just do that instead because listen, we're told that those trials and temptations are coming anyway. So how about you make us ready by delivering us from evil? That seems to be what he's telling us to do. And it leads us into a pretty interesting spot as we close this little session on prayer. You know, we want to think that, that praying is all about, you know, getting better. We want to think that praying is like approaching the giant cosmic vending machine in the sky and putting in the right input so we can get out what we want. I'm going to come to God and ask him if he'll heal me so that I'm better. I'm going to come to God and ask him if he'll strengthen me so that I'm not weak. I'm going to come to God and ask him if he'll help me to win the lottery so I'm not poor. I'm going to come to God and ask him if he'll fix all the relationships that I just toasted with my bad attitude. That's what I'm going to do. And I, and I know because I have faith that God's just going to deliver. But what Jesus has taught us here is that's not what praying is about at all. Praying is about discipleship. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be Christ-like. He is, in the vernacular, the coolest. And I want to be like him. I want to follow him and do the things that he does and think the way that he thought and, and speak to people in the way that he spoke to people. And I want to see the kingdom advanced before me like he saw the kingdom advanced before him. That's, that's the goal of being a disciple, is to be like Christ. And what he has taught us in this prayer is that that's all that this is. I'm going to approach my Father in heaven, not because it's something so great about me, but because it's something so great about him. I'm going to approach him, and I'm going to start off right away by saying, Lord, I'm coming to you for the sake of your kingdom, not for mine. I'm coming to you so that you'll have a smile on your face, even if it costs me. I'm coming to you so I can be your servant, not so that you can be my servant. And Lord, I'm coming to do your will, not ask that you do mine. I'm setting aside what I want completely so that I can be ready to do what you want. And Lord, I'm coming to you acknowledging that there are deficits in me, but understanding that you have paid it off. And as a result, I'm coming to you not saying, Lord, would you zap that guy because he was mean to me, but rather I'm coming to you saying, Lord, I know that you've already paid his bill too. So can you just set us both free? And as long as we're talking about being set free, Lord, can you set me free from that thing inside of me that's trying to ruin my life? That selfishness inside of me? And he'll take you right back to the beginning. You bet I can. You bet I can. As long as you get down off of the throne of your own life and come and kneel before me and mine. As long as you surrender all that you are to me. If you try to keep any one part of it, well, it's crouching at the door trying to consume you, you rule over it. You have to set it aside. Does that make sense? This seems to be where this prayer is going. It's a continual reminder of the fact that we need to be fully surrendered, fully in submission to Him, that we need to come to Him not to advance our agenda, but to find out what His agenda is. That the greatest point of prayer is not that God would move in our world, but that He would transform us individually. And so that's what we're going to pray for. And as we gather together on Sunday evenings in the fireside room, you all should join us. We can gather in here if there's too many people. We'll gather together and we'll pray, Lord, that you would transform us, us personally first. We'll gather together and say, Lord, would you transform my family? Would you transform my church? Would you transform my community? We want to be like you. We want to be disciples. We want to be promoting your kingdom, not not asking that you promote ours. That's what we're going to do.
So let's start now. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you that you have offered to make us new, to set us free, that we might be transformed. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this opportunity to instead of live a life of struggle and pain and difficulty as we try to find our own way in following you, that you have offered, O Lord, that you'll set us free. So, Lord, we come to you now and we ask that you would move in our hearts and in our lives, that we would be more like you. We want to be your disciples. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Would you stand with us as we close? Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. I know that's in heaven. Rise here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. I know that's in heaven. Right here in my heart. Give us this day. As we close, remember the ministry fair. Remember that there will be reverse bouncers at the door. you got to be able to show them you signed up for something. There's some good stuff out there. I actually saw the Crisis Pregnancy Center people show up. There's some really cool opportunities there. Take a look and be a part.
only dismissed to the back hallway. That's where you go next. Let me pray for you and we'll go, Lord, I thank you so much for these folks. I thank you that they desire to serve you. And I pray, oh Lord, that we would grow to be the church that you have called us to be in this community, that we could affect this world for you. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you.